today we're reviewing NVIDIA's new GTX 1660, and technically, the one we tested is an EVGA 1660, but, and I'm sorry, Jacob, but we're in MSI's headquarters. So MSI is the backdrop for this. They also have 1660s. We're gonna be looking at the 1660 performance today, stock and overclocked, versus primarily the 1660 Ti versus the RX 590, Vega 56, and basically every other card nearby in the stack. So today's focus, is on NVIDIA's new $220 price floor video card, the GTX 1660. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Corsair One i140 Compact Gaming PC. The Corsair One i140 is a small form factor PC outfitted with a 9700K, RTX 2080, 32GB of RAM, and a 480GB NVMe SSD, all housed within a 2mm thick aluminum chassis. The Corsair One i140 is a 12-liter system fit for desktop use with the same sized i160 counterpart with higher-end parts. Learn more at the link in the description below. MSRP for the 1660 is technically about $220. That's the price floor NVIDIA sets, but the partner model we're looking at is going to be about $250 for the EVGA 1660 dual fan that we reviewed. These we're checking the price on. We'll put them in a title card on the screen if we get them in time. So this is the Gaming X 1660 from MSI. There's also an Armor 1660, which should be the cheaper version probably, but Armor OC. And one thing that we learned in the process of testing the 1660 was that if you get a model like we tested with a higher power target, the overclocking headroom will actually allow you to bring the 1660 up in performance to about 1660 Ti stock levels, which is very interesting because it's, it's a study in buying one price tier cheaper of a component and then you just put maybe 20 minutes of manual effort into it and it becomes the next price class up. So if you start at a $240, $250 price point for a 1660 non-TI and then overclock it, you get to about the same performance levels as a 1660 Ti stock card at the $280 price floor, which will probably have a, like a 130 watt maximum board power. So, and, and the 1660 that we tested also gets up to about 130 watt board power, and, and we'll look into these MSI ones later perhaps. So uh, let's get straight into the charts. Patrick ran all the tests for us. We're remote, we're still in China, but we're almost done here. And he ran the test. We have thermals, power, and gaming to look at today, and then we'll talk conclusions and if it's worth the money, especially at the $250 boosted price point of EVGA's dual fan card that we're looking at today. Apex Legends is still new to our charts and not as heavily populated with cards as our later games. This one is important for its relevance, but also because it's built atop a modified source engine with DirectX 11 as the API, giving us a title that represents performance on much of the games on the market. We retested the 1660 Ti in this game, but we haven't yet retested all of the other cards. Recent updates have improved performance on the 1660 Ti and Apex Legends, so this is NVIDIA driver side. We also need to revisit some others later once we're home from China. We'll use our multiplayer test course that we heavily detailed in our previous content, tested first at 1080p. This test placed the GTX 1660 at 90 FPS average with high settings, or 101 FPS when overclocked. For reference, the 1660 Ti XC's stock performance was about 99 FPS average stock, or about 102 FPS average when overclocked. We did not see much performance uplift or scaling with the 1660 Ti's overclock in Apex Legends after the update. At least, we didn't see as much as before when we first tested the game, and some of this we'll look at again in 1440p. We tested this a total of three separate times, including full driver wipes for validation and confirmed this performance all of those times. The 1660 was the closest to the TI in Apex Legends, with most other games showing 13 to 17% performance advantage stock to stock between the two. The RX Vega 56 card for reference ended up at about 106 FPS average, with the RX 590 card at about 89 FPS average. Tested at 1440p, the 1660 stock card still pulled about 61 FPS average, although lows started dragging behind. Performance is reasonable, and the game can be played at about 1440p, even with this card. It's just that the settings should probably be dropped slightly to better accommodate heavy combat areas and the initial drop-in. The 1660 Ti, for what it's worth, was at about 68 FPS average, posting a lead of around 11% over the 1660 non-Ti. Overclocking the 1660 got it to 72 FPS average, which is where the 1660 Ti OC landed. The two are within margin of error. Sniper Elite 4 is still our best example of a good DirectX 12 implementation. We tested this one with both 1080p and 4K resolution, but please note 
that the 4K testing is meant to be treated as more of a synthetic representation of performance from card to card because we have so many cards on the chart it's easy to make those comparisons. This is done because 4K gives us a full range of performance without CPU bottlenecks at the top end of the stack so we can compare the cards all to each other without any performance limitations from the game engine side. Starting with the more synthetic 4K workload, the GTX 1660 posted 39 FPS average with the lows very close by at 34 FPS 1% and 33 FPS 0.1%. These are pretty consistent overall. Comparatively, the GTX 1660 Ti Xe under stock conditions posted 45 FPS average or a lead of about 16% over the GTX 1660. The 1660 is outperformed marginally by the RX 590, which held a lead of a few FPS average and is not too dissimilar from the GTX 1060 6GB 37 FPS average. Overclocking the 1660 to 160 MHz offset got it to 45 FPS average, matching the performance of the GTX 1660 Ti stock card, roughly matching the RX 590 Fatboy overclock results of 46 FPS average and allowing the 2060 stock card a lead of 24%. Moving on to 1080p testing, the GTX 1660 pushed 110 FPS average stock, allowing the 1660 Ti Xe a lead of about 14%. The RX 590 Fatboy ended up at 120 FPS average, pushing closer to the 1660 Ti than the 1660 in this title. Sniper is compute intensive and allows AMD to leverage its architecture more than most other games do. Overclocking the 1660 got it to 126 FPS average, marking it as equivalent to the stock 1660 Ti Xe and within margin of error. It also allowed the card to outperform the RX 590 overclock, but this is insignificant beyond declaring that the two can be made to be equal. The rough 2 FPS difference can't really be called observably better, although it is measurable, but it can certainly show a minimum of equal performance. F1 2018 is next. For this one, tested first at 1080p, the GTX 1660 non-TI ended up at 92 FPS average, with lows at about 50 FPS and 31 FPS for 1% and 0.1% lows, respectively. The performance allowed the 1660 Ti XC a lead of about 13.7%, overclocking the 1660 to a 160 MHz offset, pushed it to 104 FPS average, which is the exact same performance we got out of the 1660 Ti XC. Even the lows are roughly identical. Sure, overclocking the 1660 Ti gets it another 5 FPS average, but at some level, it may be better to step down to a 1660 and settle for Ti baseline performance. And keep in mind too, that the 1660 Ti we tested had a TDP of 130 watts, so it's 10 watts over stock, but it did not have any power offset allowance, unlike some of the other cards, like the 1660 non-Ti that we're reviewing today. If you wanted 1660 Ti stock performance, the 1660 could be purchased and overclocked for the same performance level and less money. Vega 56 hit 115 FPS average when stock, for reference, with the RX 590 8GB card holding at 82 FPS average when stock. And just to clarify there, saying for reference means for your reference, not necessarily with the reference card. The Vega 56 and RX 590 cards ran tighter frame time consistency than Nvidia does in this game, with Vega 56 advantage to a point of low frame time performance averaging to about 60 FPS 0.1% lows, whereas the 1660 Ti and 1660 both sit in the 30s. At 1440p, the 1660 non-Ti operated at 70 FPS average, giving the 1660 Ti a lead of about 10 FPS average, or about 14%. Once again, overclocking ties things up between the OC1660 and the stock 1660 Ti. The 1660 is fully capable of playing F1 2018 at 1440p and could be made more consistent in frame times with some settings tweaks. Performance is about at the same level of the GTX 1070 stock card when overclocked and better than a 1066 gigabyte and also not too distant from an overclocked RX 590, which is an overclocked RX 580, which is an overclocked RX 480. Far Cry 5 is next. At 1080p, the GTX 1660 ran an 81 FPS average, putting it as the closest in performance to an overclocked RX 590 and allowing the GTX 1660 Ti stock card a lead of about 13 FPS average or 16%. This is consistent with other results. Vega 56 maintained a strong lead over both the TI and, obviously, the non-TI for this game, but pricing also structures the 56 and 1660 at much different price classes. The 1660's overclock planted it once again at TI level performance. At 1440p, the 1660 card stock still managed to nearly hit the magical 60 FPS mark that everyone wants and is close enough that it could be made to work reasonably well at 1440p with some settings tweaks. At 56 FPS average and 64 FPS average when overclocked, the card nearly hit 1660 Ti performance even at the higher resolutions. 
The GTX 980 Ti was also roughly tied with the overclocked 1660 for reference, with the stock RX 590 ending up functionally tied with the GTX 1660. Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080p plays 1660 stock performance at about 74 FPS average, allowing the 1660 Ti a lead with its 85 FPS average, or about 15%. Once again, this lead is consistent with other titles and seems to be about the average percentage in Greece. Overclocking the 1660 with a 160MHz offset allowed it to match the 1660Ti stock card, which then climbed another couple FPS when it, too, was overclocked. The 1660 OC performed about where the GTX 1070 is, with the stock GTX 1660 at about RX 590 performance, including lows that were within margin of error, or close enough. At 1440p, the GTX 1660 fell to 50 FPS average, roughly tied with the RX 590's 51 FPS average and low performances within the margin of error of the RX 590. The 1660 Ti ended up 14% ahead of the GTX 1660, with in range of our previously plotted differences, while the 1660 OC pushed it up to 1660 Ti XC stock performance levels. The 1660 Ti XC overclock permitted another 5% performance over stock, but the 1660 overclock permitted 15% performance uplift. This massive headroom is what allowed for the tie-making performance. Note, however, that the GTX 1660 we're reviewing has power target increase availability or allowance of about 23%, whereas the 1660 Ti XC reviewed at the low end of the price stack remained capped at 130 watt TDP, about the same as what our 1660 was doing. And 130 watts is still 8% higher than a stock 120 watt reference TDP of a 1660 Ti. The 1660 Ti XC, if it also had a 23% performance allowance, or power allowance, could be pushed a little bit further and would increase the gap that you're seeing here. It's just that for these two cards, the 1660 non-Ti can be made to match the Ti up until a point of overclocking where minor differences emerge. Finally, for the GTA 5 performance at 1080p, the GTX 1660 ended up at 85 FPS average, allowing the 1660 Ti XC a lead of about 10 FPS average or about 13%. Overclocking, as the last several charts, got the 1660 to about same performance as the 1660 Ti XC stock card. The RX 590 ended up far behind here, with Vega 56 also stuck at lower performance levels than seen in other titles relative to the NVIDIA cards. The way GTA 5 is built tends to favor NVIDIA devices, which isn't for any reason aside from how much compute is used in each game, and so the 1660 does favorably here. 1440p plays to the 1660 stock card dead at 60 FPS average, but its frame time performance became more variable and dropped to about 32 FPS 0.1% lows. Some settings reductions would be recommended to improve frame time consistency, although the card is overall capable of running GTA 5 at 1440p with these settings. Overclocking pushed it to 70 FPS average, or about the same as the 1660 Ti XC, once again, and about the same as the Vega 56 Red Dragon card from Power Color. For that overclock we've been showing, Patrick stepped the card up to its maximum power target and saw performance hold consistently at 1935 MHz with few dips between. This is often rare, and it's a result of power limitation and positions restricting clocks as the frequency bounces off of that power limit. But with no core offset applied and just the power limit increased, the clock becomes consistent and holds steady. This remains true at 100 MHz offset, where we're still not hitting a power limitation. Skipping a few steps, we saw crashes at 175 MHz offset on this card and so settled on 160 MHz with a 15 MHz increment being about the minimum stepping that can be applied to NVIDIA cards. At 2070 MHz, there's not much to be mad at with this card. 2070 is a strong frequency to hold for a mid-range video card. Memory ended up at about 2480 MHz. We often stick closer to 400 to 500 MHz offset for GDDR5, but we didn't see any performance decay in games with this 960 offset. The memory is good enough on this device, the one that we tested, and holds these higher clocks without issue. You'll sometimes see soft memory errors with this type of offset, but in the games we tested, those didn't impact performance if they occurred. It may be more of a concern with professional applications, although we doubt many people are using a 1660 with those types of applications. So overall, the overclocking on this card was good. It was good enough to make it into a 1660 Ti stock when running with that overclock. Power consumption testing is done at the wall, but uses heavily controlled test benches for accurate tests run to run. We're looking at a total system power consumption in this test, so it's not the individual card power. 
The GTX 1660 peaked at about 258 watts total system power consumption when stock, averaging closer to 200 watts total system power draw. Our 1660 Ti saw about the same power consumption for reference, but keep in mind that partner model cards can change power target beyond reference total board power provided by NVIDIA's spec table, which is what happened here. The RX 590, for further reference, plotted at about 325 watts peak power consumption and remained more consistent in its higher power draw, whereas the NVIDIA cards will power throttle more aggressively during testing. The RX 590 ended up about 70 to 120 watts higher than NVIDIA's 16 series power consumption, depending on the test. Thermal torture testing, though, is up next. Under stock auto conditions, the EVGA 1660 that we tested kept a thermal target of about 60 degrees Celsius, illustrated by the thermal over time plot holding steady at 60 C. This had a fan ramping to about 1800 RPM against its maximum fan speed on the cooler of 3500 RPM, and we allow this to be automatically controlled. So we're letting the BIOS on the card dictate the fan speed, which allows us to see how it performs and what its thermal targets are out of the box. Thermally, the GPU does well, and the fan RPM could be manually run at a less aggressive curve if lower noise were desired rather than lower thermals. Switching over to the frequency chart, we see one of the most impressive frequency lines we've ever plotted for a stock card. It's nearly a perfectly flat line in our 3D Mark test, a result of the lower thermal target that kept this card under 60 degrees Celsius for the duration of this particular test. The card operated at about 1920 MHz constantly when under stock conditions and with our 3D Mark Firestrike Extreme fixed workload. This illustrates good thermal performance of the cooler and that we're not bouncing off of major power limits under stock conditions. 1660 positioning then, after all the charts, after you've seen all the gaming performance, it ends up where at the $250 price point, the card is, it's obviously a replacement for the 1066 gigabyte, clearly, and it's a decent replacement at that. It's a competitor to some extent with the RX 590, which is about the same price, plus or minus maybe 40 bucks, depending on the model. And for the RX 590 to really compete well, it needs to come down in price closer to the 1660 overclock models or the ones that are easily overclocked anyway, like the one we had. So RX 590 is in a bit of a, a rough spot right now, performance wise. The 590, we'd like to see it closer to the $220 range, depending, and there might be some out there at this point. Remember that prices on launch of cards, the competitors, of those cards will often change the prices. So you might see the 590 come down a bit by the time this review goes up. And we'll double check and see if that is the case and update in a news video what we think of so. But 590 needs to come down a bit to be truly competitive. 56, we'd like to see stay in the 280 to maybe $310 price range. At that price range, 56 is a really good deal, but it's often more than that. And that's where the 1660 Ti starts to look really good, especially at the $280 price floor for that one. So the 1660, it, really where it shines, we think, is if you buy something like the dual fan models, maybe like one of these ones in the background here, the Armor or Gaming X or something like that, depending on where the price is, if it's in the 240 to maybe 260 range, and you put 20 minutes of work into overclocking it, you can get it up to 1660 Ti performance when it's stock. So that's really not bad. If, if you're willing to put in a couple minutes of work, you can save about 30 bucks off the top of the 1660 Ti price. And for people who are on a really strict budget, the 1660 does well in those instances. So that's going to be it for our look right now. The 1660 does fine. It's GDDR5, so it's a bit different. But performance-wise, once you kind of match the clocks, it's not all that different in gaming because a lot of the games are more frequency bound on the core than they are bandwidth bound on the memory, which is what we saw today in our gaming test where the 1660 brings up performance to 1660 Ti class. Uh, so that's it for now. We'll be home soon and do some more testing on the 1660 cards once we get back. Thank you for watching as always. Subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net to support us directly and also check back for our MSI factory tour because it's gigantic and they make millions of video cards and motherboards per month. So check back for that. I'll see you all next time.